How's everyone doing today? Good, good. good. So uh, obviously, Pastor Tyler is in Mexico. Um, if you guys would just remember to keep them in prayer. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been on any missions trips before, but um, there's always challenges, both expected and unexpected. And uh, if you are planning to take 80 high school students with you, uh, you know that they could probably use a lot of prayer. So um, they're going to be doing things like a VBS. They're going to be um, doing some construction projects and things like that. So um, specifically today, they're going to be crossing the border, and Pastor Tyler asked that we would uh, lift that up in prayer because that's become apparently a little bit more difficult in recent times uh, than in years past. And uh, so just remember them in prayer. Uh, real quickly, my name is Christopher Burnham. Uh, I am not one of the pastors here at River Valley, uh, but I do have the privilege of serving on the leadership team here at the Redwood Campus. Uh, I also occasionally play bass guitar on the worship team. Uh, my wife, Annie, uh, who just led us uh, in worship, we've been married for almost seven years now. Uh, we have, yeah, um, we have a, a two-year-old son, well, almost two years old, uh, named Micah, and another little one on the way, so we're very excited about that. Um, but anyway, with uh, <laughs> scattered applause, uh, I know you're applauding in your hearts. Um, uh, but with Pastor Tyler and Austin being gone, uh, Pastor Chuck asked if I would give the message this morning, so you're kind of getting the, the third string quarterback. Uh, but you know, it worked out so well for the Raiders, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, no, with God's grace, we'll, we'll be fine. Uh, so I'd actually like to pray again, so let's bow our heads. Father, uh, God, you are so good. Lord, um, we admit that in and of ourselves, we have nothing of value. God, but you in your grace and in your mercy have, have saved us, Lord. You have paid the price through Jesus Christ on the cross for us to be reconciled with you. And God, there is no greater thing than that. And so we praise you and we thank you. Lord, we, we lift up uh, the Mexico mission once again, God, and we ask that you would grant them favor as they cross the border. Lord, and may... Uh, May not only these students grow in grace and knowledge of Christ, but may they be used for the furthering of your kingdom. And God, we just ask for uh, safety upon them. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon this service. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be present, working in our lives, opening our hearts, opening our minds. Lord, speak through me. Uh, God, I... I just ask, who am I to open your word to your people? And yet, Lord, you have placed your Holy Spirit in me, and so I am completely reliant upon you. And God, we praise you. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so we're continuing today our journey through the book of Genesis. Uh, today we're going to be in chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 11. Now, actually, the assigned portion for this week that, that the various campuses are going through includes chapters 10 uh, as well as 11. Chapter 10 is, is what's traditionally called the table of nations. So it's kind of this bird's eye view of the different nations and people groups that would descend from the line of uh, the sons of Noah. Uh, and, and the latter two-thirds of chapter 11 uh, are comprised mostly of the genealogy of Abraham. But nestled in between the table of nations and the genealogy of Abraham is this strange story, uh, one that's probably familiar to many of you, uh, especially if you grew up in the church. And it's this story that we're going to be looking at today. It's commonly called the Tower of Babel. Uh, so if you have your Bibles... Uh, Genesis chapter 11, we're going to be starting in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible today, uh, it's right there. Okay. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. 
And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. So this account at the Tower of Babel is probably one of the most vivid illustrations of the folly of man's pride. Uh, but really, ever since Genesis chapter 3, when, when Adam and Eve first rebelled against God, this, this shadow of pride has kind of loomed over everything. In fact, in talking about the sin of Adam and Eve, St. Augustine writes, Pride is the beginning of sin. And what is pride but the craving for undue exaltation? And this is undue exaltation when the soul abandons God to whom it ought to cleave as its end and becomes a kind of end to itself. This happens when the soul becomes its own satisfaction. So whether or not pride is, is really the root of every sin, and, and I kind of think that it, that it is, it's certainly at the heart of so much evil that we see not only in the world around us, but in our own lives as well. So today we're going to examine three hallmarks of pride from the people in our text, but then we're also going to look briefly at another passage and see how Jesus is the perfect refutation of man's pride. So our big idea for today is what man tries to do in pride resulting in judgment Christ accomplishes in humility, resulting in grace. What man tries to do in pride, resulting in judgment, Christ accomplishes in humility, resulting in grace. So the passage begins by telling us that the whole world had one language, they had one speech. The world was united in a way that we're obviously very unfamiliar with today. Now, these events don't take place very long after the flood. In, in fact, in Genesis chapter 10, we know that the, the leader of this group of people at Babel was a man by the name of Nimrod, um, who's actually the grandson of Ham. So we looked at Ham last week. He's one of the sons of Noah. Uh, common estimates put these events at Babel at about 100 years after the flood. And so Nimrod is leading this group of post-flood people. They're, they're migrating around from place to place. They're living this nomadic lifestyle until they come to the plain of Shinar. And for whatever reason, at this time and at this place, they decide to, to settle down and to establish a place of permanence. And so the first hallmark of pride seen here is that the people had a casualness toward God. A casualness toward God. So how do we know that the people were casual toward God? Well, certainly the people had a knowledge of God and of his commandments. In fact, Noah himself, whom the apostle Peter calls a preacher of righteousness, would have still been alive during this time. Genesis 9.28 tells us that he lived for 350 years after the flood. So they, they would have had some knowledge of God. I mean, they would have been hearing it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So we know that the people treated God casually because they disregarded his commands, specifically the command that God gave to Noah and his sons after the flood, Genesis chapter 9, we looked at this last week, that they were to be fruitful, to multiply, 
and to fill the earth, to spread out, to subdue the earth. And yet look at the motivation of the people here in building the city. In verse 4, they say, let us build a city, a tower with its tops in the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So Jesus said it this way in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love God, if we, if we cherish him, if we're passionate about him above all else as we ought to be, we're going to want to do the things that please him. We're going to want to obey him. We're going to want to honor him with our lives. And so their casualness, and, and this is important, their casualness toward God led to open rebellion against God. Their casualness toward God led to open rebellion against God. And this is what we have to be so aware of in our own lives, especially for those of us who, who were maybe raised in the church, who've been Christians for a long time. We, we become familiar with Christ. We, uh, we become familiar with his word and what he's done for us. And those are all good things. We want to be familiar with God. We want to have that intimacy with Christ. But if we're not careful, if we don't keep our hearts with all diligence, as Proverbs 4 tells us, we can allow that familiarity to stagnate into casualness. And so we find ourselves actually growing accustomed to the fact that we have a relationship with the God of the universe, as if it's kind of no big deal. We find ourselves more excited by watching sports, or playing video games, or the newest iPhone, or friends and family, vacations, fill in the blank, rather than the fact that our names are written down in heaven, and that we have an eternal hope in Christ. And it's in these times when our hearts have grown cool toward God, when our hearts have lost their first love, that this inner casualness begins to display itself in overt acts of rebellion. The second hallmark of pride displayed by the people is that their confidence was in their own capabilities. Their confidence was in their own capabilities. They say, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, bitumen for mortar. We can build a tower, we can build a city. The people here display an ultimate confidence in their own capabilities, their, their technology, their ingenuity, their knowledge, their resourcefulness and determination. Does any of this kind of ring any cultural bells? I mean, the world is always trusted in its own capabilities. That's part of fallen human nature. But it seems like we here in our society, Western society, we, we kind of have this one in spades. I think in America, we just tend to call it the American spirit. But this is really the essence of that human, humanistic philosophy that says that we can solve any problem that we face. We can overcome any challenge that we confront. We can shape and forge our own destiny through sheer force of will. There's a, a well-known and well-loved poem uh, that I think really kind of encapsulates this philosophy. It's written by a man named William Ernest Henley. Uh, it's entitled Invictus, which means uh, unconquered. It says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeoning of chance. My head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. 
So many of us may, may feel stirred by those words. I mean, there's a part of me that can't help but feel some sense of inspiration at those words. But the question is, is, is it the right kind of inspiration? Are we really to seek to be the masters of our own fate, the captains of our own soul? Do we even have that capability? 1 Samuel 2, 6-7 through 7 says, The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. James 4, 13 through 16 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I think the Lord sums it up for us in Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. He says, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The third hallmark of pride displayed by the people of Babel is that they craved the praise of men. They craved the praise of men. Let us make a name for ourselves, they say. But did you know that desiring praise is not necessarily a bad thing? It only depends on whose praise you seek. During the last days of Christ's ministry before the crucifixion, Jesus was immensely popular with the common people. But in John 12, 42 and 43, we read, Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. So here were the leading people in Israel, traditionally those who were most resistant to Christ, and many were coming to believe in him. They were beginning to think, perhaps this Jesus really is the Messiah. We've heard his teachings, we've seen his miracles. They were starting to think, as Nicodemus said to Christ in John chapter 3, no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And yet, sadly, this conviction, this belief that the leaders had was not enough. Why? Because they were more concerned about their status they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. They were more concerned about their reputation. They didn't want to lose the favor of the Pharisees. In short, as the text says, they loved human praise rather than the praise that comes from God. And this is one more area in which we must ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see the motivations of our own hearts, to pray with David in Psalm 139 where he says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So ask yourself today, is the praise that comes from God really what I am seeking in my life? Do I really live in such a way that my greatest desire is to one day hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Or are you more concerned with 
the praise, the approval that comes from maybe your parents or your spouse, your boss, your coworkers, your friends and peers, your, your church, your pastor. When we begin to desire the praise of men over the praise that comes from God, we're effectively, we're engaging in idolatry because everything that we do and say, the way that we live our lives will be motivated by that desire to receive the praise of that which we have put up in place of God. Do we desire the praise from God over the praise of men? So as the people of Babel were exhibiting these hallmarks of pride, the Lord brings judgment upon them. He divides their tongues. The people are dispersed. Last week, Pastor Tyler made the connection between uh, chapters 8 and 9 that it it kind of mirrors chapters 1 through 3 with a, a second Eden, second fall, and a second promise. And in that same vein, I think that that this scene here at Babel rightly mirrors the state of the world in Genesis chapter 6, where we see humanity united, but united to do evil. Cast in that light, I think that we see that even in the midst of God's judgment, he is showing mercy. Rather than destroying the people outright, as he did in in Genesis chapter 6 with the flood, He merely frustrates their evil plans, restrains their wickedness. And I think we see that in what God says about the people. This is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So rather than allow them to persist in their united rebellion, God confuses their languages and scatters them. The pride of man resulted in judgment and division. And that's the end of the account at Babel. But as you guys know, that's not the end of the story. Turn with me, if you would, to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. So you'll recall that the Apostle John is receiving this vision from the Lord of of a future vision of heaven. He sees God's throne. He sees a lamb as though it had been slain, obviously Jesus Christ. He's he's also seen other things like this scroll with seven seals, these uh, 24 elders, these four living creatures, and there's there's a lot of of imagery and symbolism throughout the book of Revelation that we don't have time to unpack. But I want to look specifically at this song that is sung in heaven by the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and they're singing this song to Jesus in verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So notice the difference between this kingdom in Revelation 5 and the people of Babel. The cry of Babel was, come, let us. Let us make bricks. Let us build a city and a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. The cry of heaven is, worthy are you, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. Whereas the people of Babel tried to create a kingdom without God, 
Christ creates a kingdom to God, a, a kingdom, according to Hebrews 12, 28, that cannot be shaken, an everlasting kingdom. Whereas the pride of Babel resulted in one people being made many, the humility of Christ results in many people being made one. And this humility is displayed most greatly in this, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the the second person of the Trinity, took on human flesh, dwelt among us. He lived a perfect life. And he was slain. And by his blood, many were ransomed, purchased, bought back, redeemed for God. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, familiar to many of you. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of Of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus said it this way in in Mark 10 45 For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, the saints of heaven, they recognize that it's not by their own works, it's not by their own righteousness, their own merit that they're able to enter into God's presence and stand before him. It is only by grace, by God's grace, in the finished work, the infinite merit and the perfect righteousness of Christ that they have been made citizens of a heavenly kingdom, sons and daughters of God. And so I must ask you this morning, where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself in Genesis 11 or Revelation 5? Do you find yourself relating more with the people of Babel, being casual in your relationship with God? or placing your your confidence, your hope in your own capabilities, or craving the praise, the desire, the adulation of people over the praise that comes from God? If you do, then I, I pray that you would be warned. Be warned by what happened to the people at Babel, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Our only hope is to stand on the merit of Jesus Christ, to realize and embrace that we can't earn God's favor, but we can accept his favor that is freely offered to us through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. If you've been striving this morning, if you've been trying to work for and earn God's favor or just to be the master of your own fate, know that whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So humble yourself today. Heed the words of Christ, the open invitation that he extends to you. Come, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. God, we humble ourselves before you now. Lord, we admit, we confess, so often we try to do things in our own strength. We try to walk in our own wisdom. We try to accomplish 
in the flesh, but can only be accomplished in the Spirit. God, we just pray that we would search our hearts, that you would bring to light those areas in our lives where we are living in our own strength, that we would confess them and repent of them, that we would walk in the grace that you provide through Jesus Christ. So God, be pleased to use us as we go from this place. Lord, may we be filled with your spirit. May we live our lives as citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.